Across the Mediterranean Sea, a young boy inherited the kingdom of France and went on to create an image of the world's most glorious king. His reign lasted for 72 years, the longest in European history. But his wealth and power were not as grand as they might have seemed. By the time you get to Louis XIV, you're really in an era when you're talking about rule by public impression and celebrity. That he wasn't a great conqueror, he wasn't even a great administrator, but he knew how to dress. He appeared to be a glamorous person, and it was almost the beginning of the cult of celebrityhood, way back there in his time. There's nothing like the great conquest of Genghis Khan, nothing like the law-giving abilities of Solomon. Louis was only 15 in 1654, when he was crowned sovereign of more than 19 million French subjects. The kings who ruled before him relied heavily on the advice of their ministers. But when Louis was only 23 years old, he bucked tradition and declared that he would now rule by himself. For 54 more years, he immersed himself so deeply in every aspect of his kingship that he was known to say, L'état, c'est moi. I am the state. He was hailed by the people of Paris as Louis the Grand, known throughout Europe as the Sun King. It was a fitting symbol. As the sun gives life to all things, King Louis believed he gave life to his country. He believed very much in this craft uh, of being a king. He spent six to eight hours uh, behind the desk reading dispatches. He was a great believer in the majesty of kingship and did a great deal to design an image of himself as a great king. He was probably somebody that most people today would have found rather rigid, very aloof, rather difficult. But of course, as far as Louis were concer was concerned, these characteristics were part of the majesty of kingship, and he didn't regard being a ruler as somebody who went round being a chum. Though he lived in palaces all his life, none was a better symbol of Louis XIV's grandeur than the 2,000-room chateau of Versailles. Versailles was a stage for the display of power. The whole organization of Versailles, the painted chambers with on the, on the ceiling scenes of military glory associated with Louis XIV, the big uh, room with all the mirrors, uh, these were designed as stages for Louis's majesty in order to show his power before um, his subjects and before visitors. Versailles was a great show of France's strength. But the power of the king's court was clearly illustrated by wealth of a different kind. His wealth also had to be measured uh, in very direct terms in the kind of military power he could put on the chessboard of Europe, if you will. France was probably the greatest military power. Louis XIV took control of Dutch territory that today is part of Holland attacked the Spanish Netherlands and captured part of Flanders and Luxembourg. And he seized Alsace-Lorraine from the Holy Roman Empire. He could date the day upon which a city that was besieged would fall. And he would invite the ladies and gentlemen of the court to come out and watch the fall of the city. So even warfare for him was spectacle. King Louis kept his country at war for almost his entire reign. And some of his most brutal battles were waged against his own people. There is a passage in Madame de Sévigny's journal in which she comments on how many trees are lean to one side of the roads. And that was because, as she notes, so many peasants had been hung from those trees. King Louis XIV died in 1715 at the age of 77. On his deathbed, he said, I have loved war too much. Despite the bloodshed, he is remembered as the king of all kings, the quintessential example of the Grand Monarch. Louis XIV was central in creating the modern nation-state as a concept in Europe. The length of his reign, 
the cultural and political things he did, the consequences of his reign, just mark him as one of the decisive figures in European and therefore world history.